Hey there folks and welcome back. In this lesson we're going to talk about some applications of multiple integrals. This is a really nice sweet topic because it makes use of all the integration techniques we've learned so far, but it shows us what integrals can be used for out in the wild. So in this lesson we're going to talk about one particular application which is finding areas. Now I know what you're thinking, oh pfft, areas, come on Zach, we learned how to calculate areas back in Calc 2. I thought double integrals were supposed to calculate volumes. Well, you're absolutely right. Double integrals do calculate volumes, but they also give us new ways to calculate areas. Remember, if we're computing the double integral of a function z equals f of x, y, whose graph lives above a region r in the x, y plane, then what we're really doing is finding the volume under our surface and above that region r. That's the interpretation of our double integral. Okay, cool. If you believe that, then this double integral over here, where I've taken my z equals f of x, y to be the constant function 1, that should represent the volume above the region r and below this flat plane of height 1. Oh, but I could also think of that volume in a slightly different way. I could think of it more like the volume of a cylinder. Right? A cylinder has this circular face at the bottom, a circular face at the top, and essentially it's just a tube connecting those two faces. The volume of the cylinder is the area of the base times the height. Well, the same is going to be true here. Here I have a solid whose bottom face is given by this region R, and whose top face is also given by this region R. It's just shifted up by one unit. So if I think of this like a cylinder, I can compute its volume, which by the way is this double integral of 1 dA, as the area of the base, the area of R, times the height, which is 1. So this double integral of 1 is really computing the area of R. Now you got to admit, that's pretty cute. Back in Calc 2, you learned how to compute areas using single integrals, and now we have a formula that allows us to do it with double integrals. Now you might say, you know, who cares? If we could compute the area with one integral, why would we ever choose to use a double integral? Well, it sounds like a valid point. But keep in mind that we have certain techniques for double integrals, like converting to polar coordinates or applying a change of variables, that we just didn't have for single integrals. And sometimes these more advanced techniques simplify the computations. Let me show you an example on the next slide. As an example, I'd like to use double integrals to compute the area enclosed by an ellipse. Here the ellipse is arbitrary. x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. a and b are just some positive constants. So maybe the picture you have in mind is something like this. Here's my ellipse, and I'm looking for the area inside. Well, according to the formula that we derived on the previous slide, I should be computing the double integral over this region of the function 1. Right? So maybe I'll call this region r. I need to compute the area of the ellipse, which is the double integral over r of 1 dA. Okay, we've figured out what we need to compute, but how are we actually going to go about computing this? I don't know how to integrate over an elliptical region. This certainly wouldn't be a nice integral in Cartesian coordinates, and polar coordinates might help, but things aren't quite circular, right? They're a little stretched out. So I'm actually going to begin with a change of variables. I'm going to transform this elliptical region into something more circular. The way I'm going to do that is by noting that if this expression in the brackets were called u, and this expression in the brackets were called v, then my equation would become u squared plus v squared equals 1. This means that if I make the change of variables you see here, then this elliptical region would turn into the unit circle, which looks something like this. After we make this change, I could very easily integrate over this region by changing to polar coordinates, right? It's a circle. Okay, so I think we have a game plan. We're going to start by making this transformation by setting x equal to a u, that comes from up here, and y equal b v, again, from our equation up top. Let's see what happens when we apply our change of variables formula. Okay, so we've decided to make a change of variables. x equals a u, y equals b v. Doing this will change our area integral, the double integral over our elliptical region, into a nicer double integral, the double integral over the unit circle in the uv plane. But of course, we need to figure out our area factor. That's given by the absolute value of our Jacobian matrix. 
So let's go ahead and compute this Jacobian. My Jacobian, as you'll recall, is the determinant of partial x by partial u, partial y by partial u, partial x by partial v, partial y by partial v, and that's the determinant of, well, partial x by partial u is just a, partial y by partial u, there's no u's here, so that's going to be 0. Similarly, partial x by partial v is 0, and partial y by partial v is b. So my determinant is a, b. Recall at this point that a and b are positive constants. So when I take their absolute value here, nothing is going to happen. I can write my integral as the double integral over the inside of the unit circle, u squared plus b squared is less than or equal to 1, of a, b, d, a prime. This d, a prime term, by the way, just represents the area factor in terms of u and v. I just didn't want you to get confused with this d, a term, which is our area factor in terms of x and y. Okay, we're now faced with the task of evaluating this double integral over the inside of our unit circle. I mentioned the polar coordinates would help, right? So let's convert this into an integral involving rows and phi's. Since we're integrating over the entire inside of the unit circle, phi is going to go all the way around, from 0 to 2 pi. Rho, on the other hand, is going to extend from the center of the circle all the way out to the boundary. Rho is going to go from 0 to 1. I have a, b, and then I multiply by my new area factor, rho, d, rho, d, phi. Ah, from here we could pull out the constants a and b from our integral, and then we could separate the integral into a phi integral times a rho integral. That'll give us a, b times the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi times the integral from 0 to 1 of rho d rho. At this point, folks, both of our integrals are very straightforward to evaluate, so I'm not going to work through all the details here. You should get a final answer of pi a b. Now hopefully this answer seems sensible. I mean, after all, this integral up here is the constant a b times the double integral of 1 over the unit circle. But that should be a b times the area of the unit circle, pi a b. Okay, seems to make sense. As a final sanity check, see what happens when you set a and b both equal to a common constant r. In that case, your ellipse is really a circle of radius r, and so we know that its area should be pi r squared. Well, looks like it checks out. Pi times r times r. I'll end this video with a quick application related to finding areas. It turns out that double integrals can be used to find the average value of your function over a region r. If you think about it, when you compute an average, what you're really doing is adding up the value of a bunch of objects and then dividing by the total quantity of those objects. This is exactly how you may have computed averages back in Calc 2. If you wanted to know the average value of a single variable function over some interval a, b, well, you added up or integrated the values of that function between a and b, and then divided by the total amount. You divided by the length of the interval b minus a. In Calc 3, the situation is exactly the same. If you want to know the average value of a two-variable function over some region r, well, you can add up or integrate the values of your function over that two-dimensional region, and then divide by the total amount. You're going to divide by the area of the region. As an exercise, I'd like you to put this formula to use to compute the average value of the function fxy equals xy over this quarter unit circle in the first quadrant. You should get an answer of 1 over 2 pi. Give it a shot.